Disappearances are so fascinating, aren't they? Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Fox Akimbo, and I've got a small video for you today about the disappearance of the King of Pirates, Henry Every. If you've seen this channel before, you probably know me through my iceberg charts, where I put in 50 different entries and try to describe them all as fast as I can, but in this video, I want to do a deep dive into the career and eventual disappearance of Henry Every. I want to get into everything, his life, his beginnings, his career, his title as King of Pirates and his eventual vanishing. His story has so many twists and turns and I really want to get into it so let's cut right to it. This is the disappearance of King of Pirates, Henry Every, explained. So, so much of Every's early life is shrouded in mystery. He wouldn't become famous until later in his life. So do take this initial background with a grain of salt. However, to the best of the internet's ability, this is what we know. So the year is 1659. The Cromwells were soon to be ousted from power. Pirates were roaming the seven seas and Achy Breaky Heart was 333 years away. Something had to fill the void. A newborn Henry Every is introduced to the world in Newton Ferrers, a few miles south southeast from Plymouth, England. If you know any English geography, you already know that that is quite southeast. And yeah, he was born on the coast, which likely explains why he took the high seas later in his life. But that is ahead of ourselves because when he was a child, it's thought that his parents were actually quite well off. It's thought that they were actually established names within their local community. So who were his parents? Well, just like much of his life, it is really shrouded in mystery. But our best guess of his father might give us a small insight into what may have drove him onto the seas. It's thought that his father was actually part of the Royal Navy, serving under Ab Admiral Blake. Now those who aren't historians might not have ever heard of Admiral Blake, but long story short, this man was one of the key figures to establish Britain's dominance in the seas for the next couple hundred years. He might not be spoken about in history books as commonly as say Admiral Nelson, but to many he is considered one of the most important naval commanders in English history. Now in the 1600s it was thought that sons would carry on their father's legacies and families would tend to be dedicated to one industry compared to today whereby parents and children often have different vocations, different jobs. For this reason, it makes sense that Every would eventually join the Navy, which he eventually did. Buccaneering in the Caribbean Sea, bombarding the Algiers in 1671, and he would have actually been around 12 at this point. At one point, he also worked as a midshipman aboard the HMS Rupert, with his ship capturing a French convoy in 1689. His fortunes would turn because of this, and he slowly started to climb the ranks of the Royal Navy. He was even requested to join the captain of the HMS Rupert, Sir Francis Wheeler, on a new boat, the HMS Albemarle, where he would have very likely been in the Battle of Beachy Head against the French. Finally, his hard work had paid off. Except no, it hadn't, because at the Battle of Beachy Head, the English suffered a humiliating defeat, leading to Every's dismissal. So where to next? The year is 1690, and so Every decides to join in on what everyone's doing at that point, and he joins the slave trade. It's at this point in Every's life that documentation goes a bit dry. It's known that he did indeed take part in the slave trade, but not too much is known outside of that. But one thing I think is interesting to take note of is that Avery was actually known to lure other potential slave traders onto his ship by flying friendly English colours and then seize the slave traders themselves and chain them up in the ship's hold alongside their former captives. Whether this be his way of decreasing competition or if it was just something that he wanted to do, I'm not too sure but I did think that was worth mentioning. Additionally, I think it's interesting to take note of the slight shift in temperament from Avery. Whilst it's documented in his Navy days that he was actually a family man, never partaking in heavy alcohol or tobacco consumption, at this point in his life there definitely seems to have been a turn to the darker side for Avery. Nobody really knows what happened at this point in his life, but documentation of his wife and supposed kids does dry up so you have to wonder if he's doing this now just for himself. Here's the thing though, I could go into the nitty gritty specifics about his entire existence, his Spanish expedition shipping, but I want to skip that and get right to what you guys want to see and that is his disappearance. Now this man is known as the most successful pirate of all time, he's the king of pirates but one day he just vanished and so I want to get right into that because that is the interesting stuff that you clicked here for. So that's all the background, let's Let's get into the good stuff. I do need to mention though that via a mutiny on the Charles II, renamed to the Fancy after the takeover, 
Henry Every had began his proper pirating ways, commanding a ship and committing his first act of piracy at Mayo at the Sotavento Islands, where he robbed three English ships from Barbados of their supplies, recruiting nine men from said ship to join his crew, which now numbered 94 men. His crew kept on growing throughout 1694, with Every robbing and recruiting more and more. For example, in October, Every captured two Danish privateers, essentially warships, and taking 17 defecting Danes. Whilst in early 1695, whilst in Madagascar, Every captured a pirate ship, looting it and recruiting a massive 40 Frenchmen to join his crew, which now had amassed a mighty 150 men. However, it would also be that in 1695, Every would go missing forever. People don't realise this, right? But Every was only actually a pirate for two years. It took him two years to get the most money in pirating history and completely disappear off the face of the earth forever. In 1695, Every set sail for the volcanic island of Perim to wait for an Indian fleet that would be passing soon. This fleet was easily the richest prize in Asia, perhaps the entire world, and any pirates who managed to capture it would have been the perpetrators of the world's most profitable pirate raid. Now, even a master such as Every couldn't do this alone, so upon arriving at his destination, he teamed up with five other captains and their crews. Those captains were Thomas II, Joseph Farrow, Richard Want, William Mays, and Thomas Wake. The crews together had an estimated 440 men who went out to find the Indian fleet, and eventually, they did. They found the Grand Mughal ships, and to try and visualise just how much money and treasure was on here, imagine as much money as you can think of in the world, and times it by three. I mean, we're talking like Scrooge McDuck, swimming pools of gold coins. That's what we're talking here. So he saw those ships and the chase was on. In fairness, the Grand Mughal ships actually gave them a good chase, outpacing a few of the fleet, and with Thomas II eventually dying in battle with a Mughal ship. In the end though, it wasn't enough and Every and the crew was able to catch up with one of them and with very little resistance this time, sacked the ship. It was estimated that on this ship was between fifty dollars and $60,000, enough to buy Every ship the fancy about 50 times, but this was just one boat of the fleet and it wasn't even a big one. There was still more treasure to be found. The largest ship of the fleet, the Ganji Sawai, was captained by Muhammad Ibrahim, and he was actually quite a fearsome opponent. And after Every and the rest of the ship caught up, it was actually quite an intense battle. The ship they were trying to invade had 80 cannons and a musket armed guard of 400 as well as 600 other passengers, and so it was quite evenly matched. With the Ganji Sawai surrounded, the Indian ship went all in and started firing at will, preventing the pirates from climbing aboard. But after one of their cannons exploded, killing many and demoralizing the Indian crew, this was Every's opportunity. So he and his men on the fancy, as well as another ship in Every's fleet, the Pearl, all the men on that also invaded. Now, if you didn't know, pirate battles usually wouldn't happen. Pirates were brutal by nature, and their ploy was usually to disembowel anyone that might attempt to fight back and take over ships by fear. But on the Ganji Sawai, this did not happen. And what commenced was a two to three hour hand-to-hand -hand battle, which would have just been awesome to see. It was swashbuckling, but a few hours after a fearless but maybe perhaps a bit naive battle, the Indian ship surrendered, having killed potentially upwards of a hundred of Every's men. So alas, the day was won by the pirates who proceeded to rape and kill the prisoners, torturing them for information on where they stashed treasure on their ship. After a few days, any survivors were left aboard their empty ships, which were free to continue on its path to India. And whilst the first ship they caught and raided had between fifty and sixty thousand dollars of loot, the Ganji Sawai, the largest ship in their fleet, has somewhere in the ballpark of two hundred to six hundred thousand dollars, an absolute buttload. Each man in Every's crew was given about a thousand dollars, which is now worth about a hundred thousand plus gemstones on the side. So they're all very wealthy men after this raid. In a single battle, these men made more money than most sailors did in their entire lifetimes. With all of this money, of course, Every would have been wanted. He was the most successful pirate of all time and had only been doing it for two 
two years. As marked men, the crew had to disappear, and so after the French and Danish men from earlier left his crew, Every bought some slaves and sailed for the Bahamas. The crew had to stop for food halfway through though, and after abandoning 17 men on the barren Ascension Island and hunting sea turtles, his crew was back on the move. The aftermath of this caused a strain on the Anglo-Indian relationship. And whilst India blamed the English, the English blamed the pirates, calling them enemies of the world and announcing that all pardons and amnesties would be lost on Every, making him public enemy number one. It wouldn't matter though because Every was soon in St. Tomas in the Bahamas. And after bribing Governor Sir Nicholas Trott, the crew were given a safe haven. But this wouldn't be for long because of course, eventually word got to Trott that the people that he was harboring were in fact Avery and the rest of his fleet. And when that happened, he had to alert the authorities of Avery's whereabouts. But Avery and his men had only anticipated this, making their hasty escape from the island. This would be it for Avery and his crew. His last known words were conflicting stories about where he intended to go. And the reason that these were conflicting is that he wanted to throw off any potential search of him and prevent any possible capture. And these stories seem to work because soon he would be gone forever. Every's crew finished with a grand total of 113 members and of these, 24 would go on to be captured with five later executed. 89 of the crew, however, including Every himself, disappeared forever. It's thought that most of them went to the United States, whereas others, including Every himself, returned to England. So Brits watching this, there is a chance that you guys might be his descendants. This man's very last known whereabouts were apparently after he landed in Ireland. He and 20 members of his crew aroused suspicion after trying to unload their treasure, and two were subsequently caught. But from there, Every was never seen again. The trail runs dry. To this very day, not another living soul knows for certain what happened to Henry Every. His fate is unknown. Some people thought he died in poverty after selling all of his treasure. Other people thought that he changed his name and lived a very normal, peaceful life out in Devon. Some people thought that he still lurks among us to this very day. But considering he would be about 400 years old now, I find that very unlikely. Over the next few decades, sightings were common, but none of them were reliable. So I have a question for you. What do you think happened to him? Write your own story down in the comments if you know nothing about him, or if you do, maybe use some information that you know and try and make an argument for or against whether he died in poverty or he just lived out a very normal life. I like to think that he got back on the seas. I think that if he was to die in poverty, he wouldn't have done that. He would just got on a boat and gone somewhere else. So I don't think he died in poverty. He seems to me like the kind of person, if money was ever running low, he would just get back on a boat and sail off into the sunset. But that's just a theory, a disappearing, disappearing pirate from 450 years ago theory. <laughs> I've been Fox Akimbo. Thank you very much for watching this video. And if you enjoyed, please do hit that subscribe button. Give it a like too, that would be very nice. I have a Patreon, I have a Discord, I have a Twitter and an Instagram. If you want to message me about theories or, or, or something like that, uh, do join my Discord. I'm very active there, or at least I try to be. If you're thinking of subscribing but you're on the fence, please let it be known that I'm doing a £5 donation to Movember every thousand subscribers I get in November, and I'm doing a £10 donation to Team Seas for every thousand subscribers I get until the end of the year. So it makes no sense not to click that button. Um, it's for a great cause at the end of the day. Plus, I'm going to hopefully be making a bunch more content just like this video very soon. So with that, please let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next because I'm only 84 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.